I probably got more of a fat burning effect from a cup of coffee that I had this morning than I would get from most fat burning supplements on the market. That's the sad reality. But what ingredients and in fat burning supplements are really the biggest waste of money? Which ones are not really giving you much benefit at all? Well, let's break it down. I've got a few to share with you. Now, what we have to remember is most of the ingredients and most of the like, specific things that target fat loss, they still pull research on them, but a lot of times what happens is companies will say, oh, well, this had a powerful effect in an animal, or this had a powerful effect in an in vitro study, in a Petri dish, or this had an effect, but it was administered in a very unrealistic fashion, like put directly into the tissue or directly into the brain rather than oral consumption. It's not exactly practical, so you can't necessarily trust 100% of what is on a label. So you do your own independent research and you come up with things, right? So we're gonna break down a few of these. Now, today's video sponsor is Haya. So if you have kiddos like I do, then you know that they don't always get their greens in, right? They don't always eat the way that they're supposed to. So Haya is a multivitamin that is in a chewable, sugar-free form, sweetened with monk fruit. That's good for kiddos. Now, I will be the first to say that most adults don't really need a multivitamin. Like if you're eating, you don't really need one. Like you're probably extracting nutrients the way that you should. With kids, it's just a little bit tougher to get them to eat in a wholesome fashion. So the reason I like Haya isn't because it's just this miracle supplement or this great thing, but they understand kids and it's created by a couple of dads that think like I do. They think the same way. Like frustration with the supplement industry, frustration with what's available for kids. You look at most like kids vitamins and there's seven grams of sugar or five grams of sugar. That makes no sense to me whatsoever. So to have a cool chewable multivitamin for a kiddo that's sweetened with monk fruit and still has 12 different veggies and fruits in it, it's pediatrician approved. It just makes me smile a little bit because I like doing things that are good for my kids, but also make my kids smile and enjoy life. So there's a link for 50% off down below in the description if you want to check out today's video sponsor, Haya. So let's jump into this first one. It's Hudia. Okay, Hudia is from a cactus in South Africa. Now the indigenous people there, they used to consume this because they thought it would curb their hunger and thirst. Now there is some mechanistic data out there on it. And that's what's kind of interesting. There's some mechanisms discovered showing that yeah, Hudia might work for appetite suppression. The problem is the studies are done in animal models, which I don't have a problem with, right? Like I reference animal studies all the time. The bigger problem with that is it's unrealistic how it was administered. In this case, with Hudia and rats, they injected it directly into the brain. That doesn't exactly equate to like a pragmatic practical use of a human. So then when you look further into even the rodent data, you find there was a study that was published in the journal Ethnopharmacology that found that Hudia did actually have a mild effect on adipose tissue. It did somehow directly affect it but it was also pretty aggressively attacking muscle tissue as well. So in rodents, the weight loss that was coming from Hudia was actually coming from total weight loss. They were losing muscle as well. So effectively, not really a fat burning supplement. Now, was there an appetite suppression effect? Well, the human trials are pretty minimal. There's not a lot of them out there. And that's what I don't like when something has a lot of like weird studies or a lot of animal studies, but not necessarily the human or even the epidemiological studies to kind of back it up. So there was a study that was published in the American Journal of Clinical Nutrition, took a look at 49 overweight people, and it gave them Hudia or a placebo for 15 days. Okay, there was no change in their intake, food intake. Okay, so they didn't end up reducing their food intake like Hudia claims. Okay, although when injected directly into the brain of a rat, it did have that effect. So somehow through the actual like oral absorption and assimilation of it, something wasn't working the same that it did direct administration into the brain, right? The thing that is concerning though, is there was a small increase in bilirubin. Now that is an indicator that the liver is having a little bit of an issue there. It doesn't mean that Hudia isn't safe. Obviously it's been approved and it's on the market, but it is something that makes me go, hmm, like if I was gonna consume a lot of this stuff, would it have a negative impact? So bottom line is that I don't think it's an effective fat burner and it's pretty pricey considering that it's marketed as such. What you could do instead of consuming Hudia is probably consume things like fenugreek, fenugreek extract, fenugreek seed powder, uh, glucomannan fiber, okay? So even galactomannan fiber, which you can just Google those. Glucomannan's gonna be in like shirataki noodles, cognac root, things like that. Galactomannan you're gonna find in all, galactomannan's in fenugreek. So those are the kinds of things where from a pure mechanical digestion point, they are going to keep you satiated. Even green tea 
has the ability to increase what's called cholecystokinin, and that's going to be CCK that signals your brain to suppress your appetite. Okay, so those are gonna work a little bit better. So use those instead of Hootia. So let's move on to the next one, which is calcium. It's been a while since I've seen calcium heavily pushed as a fat burner, but for a while it was. And they still will list it as a fat burning agent in some compounds to try to like push their product a little bit more. So the whole idea with calcium and why that was thought to be a fat burner was back in the day, people that had inadequate levels of calcium well, they tended to not lose weight as quickly or effectively as people that had adequate levels of blood calcium. That is correlation, not equaling causation. That doesn't really mean anything. In fact, if you look at a study that was published in the Journal of Clinical Endocrinology and Metabolism, this took a look at subjects that consumed 1,000 milligrams of calcium okay, per day for 25 weeks. In fact, it took a look at three different studies that were 25 weeks long. And they found that there was no significant change whatsoever. No change in weight, no change in fatty acid oxidation. It didn't really do anything. So what is explaining why people that had lower levels of calcium not losing weight as well? My guess would be it has something to do with vitamin D. And that's purely my hypothetical like, analysis there. Like That is my guess. Because I feel like, OK, vitamin D and calcium have to do with one another. If you have lower levels of vitamin D, lower levels of calcium utilization, yeah, then maybe things are going to be skewed a little bit. But who knows? So vitamin D does tend to play a role with fat burning. And vitamin D does tend to play a role with that whole lipid oxidation piece. So maybe that's the piece we should be paying attention to there. OK, the next one I want to talk about is forscolin. Now, forscolin is still seen all the time as an added ingredient, and it's heavily pushed as a fat burner. And the reason that it is is because it's supposed to increase what's called CAMP, cyclic adenosine monophosphate, which is so important. CAMP is very important. It's like the key. It's like the ignition to lipolysis. Okay, Lipolysis or fat mobilization cannot occur without CAMP. But saying that forscolin is going to increase your CAMP and cause you to burn more fat, that's like, it just doesn't make sense because the m amount that you increase CAMP is so little. Okay, Now, there's some interesting data that shows that forscolin doesn't have much of an effect at all. Now, there was a study that was published in the International Society of Sports Nutrition. Okay, They gave forscolin to subjects two times a day for 12 weeks. And in this case, there was no change in fatty acid oxidation. They didn't notice that more fat was utilized at the cell. They didn't notice that more fatty acids were getting into the mitochondria and being oxidized. They did notice that there were no side effects. So at least as far as safety is concerned, it's not really a bad thing. You're probably just wasting your money if you're buying it directly. If you see it in a compound, maybe don't run the other direction, but it's definitely something that shouldn't be heavily marketed as a fat burner because it's not really doing a whole lot. Okay, so when we're talking about cyclic adenosine monophosphate, one of the biggest drivers of CAMP is simply caffeine, okay? And also the catechins in like EGCG. So having a cup of coffee or having some caffeine is probably getting you more of the CAMP effect than the forscolin. And most fat burners are still gonna have caffeine in it. So even if they were to look in a lab and say, take this fat burner, it's the forscolin triggering cyclic adenosine monophosphate levels to increase, it's probably realistically the caffeine. So that would be a better option if you ask me. And a couple notes on a couple of supplements that people talk about all the time. Carnitine. Carnitine is not a waste, if you ask me. And the reason I wanted to address this is because carnitine can be a waste. Carnitine is a waste if you are deficient in carnitine, because carnitine is required to transport a fatty acid across the mitochondrial membrane to ultimately create energy. Okay, So if you're deficient in carnitine and you supplement with carnitine, you provide your body with what it needs. So Yes, if you are not deficient, it is a waste of money. But A, how do you know you're deficient? And B, it's easy to get deficient. Okay? All it takes is intense exercise and you can deplete carnitine. Of course, you can replete it with protein and replete it with supplementation. So I wouldn't go out specifically trying to get a bunch of carnitine for that, but don't be afraid of it and don't think it's a total waste. The other one that I want to mention that gets rained on a lot, but it's also still kind of on the fence, is chromium picolinate. Okay, chromium picolinate directly as a fat burner is not a fat burner. Okay, chromium does not help you oxidize fat. In fact, chromium has really nothing to do with lipid oxidation whatsoever. So when you start seeing the stuff marketed with that, those studies are very inconclusive and usually require copious amounts of chromium. What chromium can be good for is blood glucose modulation. Okay, and that is where I like chromium. Like if you're having more carbohydrates than you normally have, can that have an effect on fat burning? Mm, possibly, but more so it can have an effect on fat accumulation. 
like, or being able to utilize more carbs and possible better carb uptake, but not fat oxidation. So it's not a fat burner, it's more of a potential blood glucose modulation tool. So Hudia, use fibers instead, galactamannan, fenugreek. Okay, calcium, just go with vitamin D instead. Okay, for scolin, go with coffee, go with green tea, go with caffeine. Chromium, use after carbohydrates, and carnitine, use after hard workouts. As always, keep it locked in here on my channel, and I'll see you tomorrow.